this is called a velum as it is has a characteristic appearance of a wedding veil or a veil that one may see on the drapes over a window. Number four identifies the inferior medullary velum. Number two identifies the pons and number three identifies the medulla. Tumors within the fourth ventricle when they enlarge can compress the brain stem and this can result in life-threatening neurologic problems. The image on the right is a view from posterior to the fourth ventricle. This is the view that we typically would see when approaching the fourth ventricle from a posterior approach and this is something that we would do for fourth ventricular tumors. When approaching these tumors it's important to identify the floor of the fourth ventricle because of the important structures that lie on the other side. Again this would be the pons and the medulla. Injury to these structures would be life-threatening. The roof of the superior of uh, the roof of the fourth ventricle, as I've already highlighted, consists of the superior and inferior medullary velum and also the cerebellum. Here are additional pictures of the fourth ventricle. The chorae plexus of the fourth ventricle lies along the inferior medullary velum, which can be seen by depicted by the number 5, 4, and 6. Here's an additional view into the fourth ventricle. One can see the chorae plexus, which is lying on top of the inferior medullary velum. Above that you can see the superior medullary velum. As I've already mentioned, but it's worth mentioning again, the ventricles are, or the ventricles contain cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is a clear fluid that is produced by the chorae plexus and circulates within the ventricular system. The cerebrospinal fluid then circulates throughout the ventricles and eventually is reabsorbed into primarily the venous system and then returned to the heart. Here you can see the characteristic clear tinge of cerebrospinal fluid. Characteristics are that it's clear, it has a fairly normal pH, and specific gravity. This picture, which is a sagittal view of the brain, depicts the production of cerebrospinal fluid and then the route in which it traverses the ventricular system. So 80% of cerebrospinal fluid is produced by the chorae plexus and is done and is produced specifically by the ependymal cells. <clears throat> it's produced at a rate of approximately 0.3 milliliters per minute or 18 milliliters per hour or 432 milliliters per day. Importantly, an adult produces approximately 150 milliliters per day, a newborn 5 milliliters. And this turns over three and a half times per day. You can see in this picture on the right where cerebrospinal fluid is produced with, by, within the chorae plexus of the lateral ventricle. It then flows through the foramen of Monroe. Additional CSF is produced within the third ventricle. And then this traverses the cerebral aqueduct, which is labeled by number two, into the fourth ventricle. Additional CSF is also produced in the fourth ventricle. And then all of this cerebral smile fluid either traverses the foramen of Magendi, again found medial, or the foramen of Lushka, found lateral, and then circulates within the subarachnoid space and is absorbed primarily by the venous system. Alternatively, cerebral smile fluid will traverse the central canal of the spinal cord to the lumbar cistern before being absorbed. <laughs> Perhaps a useful analogy to cerebral spinal fluid and its production is a kitchen sink. Cerebral spinal fluid is always being produced. 
unfortunately, it's always being absorbed as well. What can happen, however, with a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a tumor that obstructs the ventricular system is that similar to if a rag falls into the sink, the water will back up. And in the brain, this backup of cerebral spinal fluid will produce hydrocephalus and will increase the intracranial pressure. Well, many may prefer to remember that humans produce 0.3 milliliters per minute or 18 milliliters per hour and approximately 150 milliliters per day. I find it more easy to remember that adults produce approximately 150 milliliters per day or the equivalent essentially of a, a can of Coke. The absorption, as I've already alluded to, is through the arachnoid villi and the coronary plexus, with the majority of it returning in the venous system, although some is also absorbed by the lymphatic system. The slide on the right depicts the contents of cerebral spinal fluid. What is important to recognize is that cerebral spinal fluid, for the most part, is very similar to normal plasma, as can be seen by the content of sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride. It's important, however, to recognize that it is significantly different in the amount of protein and glucose that is found within cerebral spinal fluid. Because cerebral spinal fluid is devoid of any red blood cells, as can be seen by its clear tinge, the protein content is extremely low. This is very important when assessing someone for a cerebral spinal fluid infection. If there is bacteria within the cerebral spinal fluid, that will increase the protein content. Typically with a bacterial infection, the protein will be much higher. In addition, bacteria need to feed on something and will consequently consume glucose. And as bacteria consume glucose, the content of glucose will go down. Therefore, the most important substances and to recognize on this chart are the protein and the glucose. Again, with a bacterial infection, protein will be elevated and glucose will be decreased. In addition, note on the left-hand side that there are no red blood cells, no polymorphonuclear cells, and very few lymphocytes within the cerebral spinal fluid. This is, again, why it is clear. A abnormal production of cerebral spinal fluid or an abnormal absorption of cerebral spinal fluid will result in hydrocephalus. As I had already alluded to with regards to the kitchen sink analogy, because you're continuously producing cerebral spinal fluid, when the drain is obstructed, the water will back up and that will result in hydrocephalus. On the right side of the screen, you can see a very small infant with hydrocephalus. When newborns are born, the bones of the skull are not fused. This enables the head to traverse the birth canal. Because these bones are not fused, if cerebral spinal fluid accumulates, as would be expected with hydrocephalus, the head will continue to grow as you can see in the bottom right corner of this slide. Hydrocephalus originates from the Greek word hydro, which means water, and cephalus, which is head. And so it's a, it depicts abnormal accumulations through spinal fluid in the head. There are different types of hydrocephalus. One is obstructive hydrocephalus, the second is communicating hydrocephalus. Obstructive hydrocephalus is when there is an obstruction within the path of the ventricular system. For instance, and probably most common, there may be an obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct. I've already mentioned before the significance of the pineal gland and pineal tumors. Depicted on the right is a pineal tumor. 
And as the pineal tumor enlarges, it obstructs the cerebral aqueduct and leads to hydrocephalus, as can be seen in this depiction. <clears throat> Communicating hydrocephalus is when there is abnormal absorption. Because the problem is distal to the subarachnoid space, Cerebral spinal fluid will build up within the entire ventricular system. This is seen in the picture on the right hand side. In particular, the lateral ventricles are seen enlarged, as is the fourth ventricle, but also the subarachnoid space, which is seen around the cerebellum. When one has obstructive hydrocephalus, it is important not to drain cerebral spinal fluid from the lumbar cistern. If one was to do so, there would be a change in the pressure gradient with less pressure in the lumbar cistern, and that forces the brain inferior down through the foramen magnum, which leads to a condition called brain herniation. With communicating hydrocephalus, a lumbar tap or lumbar drain is oftentimes utilized and this can be done safely because the entire ventricular system has an abnormal amount of cerebral spinal fluid. There are some other forms of hydrocephalus. One form is hydrocephalus ex vacuo. This is a pseudo type of hydrocephalus. On imaging the ventricles are enlarged but they are enlarged not because of an increased production in the cerebral spinal fluid, but rather a loss of brain itself. And as the brain is atrophied, the ventricles get bigger. Hydrocephalus ex vacuo can be seen in aging, Alzheimer's disease, or Crutchfield-Jacobs disease. External hydrocephalus, which is depicted here, is when there is an abnormal accumulation of the cerebral spinal fluid that is in the subarachnoid space around the brain but not within the ventricular system. There are also some abnormal congenital disorders that can present with hydrocephalus, in particular carry malformation where there is a abnormality in the posterior fossa this oftentimes leads to an obstructive hydrocephalus. Dandy Walker syndrome, when you have atresia of the foramen of Lushka and the foramen of Magendi, the, both of these foramen, as I've already mentioned, are the foramen that communicate from the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. And here on the right, you can see this condition, again, called Dandy Walker, and it has this characteristic bat-type shape as seen on the image on the far right. The picture on the right is a fairly, is a, uh, it catches your, your attention with this child looking down. And this is called the sunsetting sign. And when there is hydrocephalus within the brain, in particular in children, you can see the sunsetting sign. And this occurs when there is pressure on the tegmentum. And this, reduce, this results in the eyes deviating down. Here is the characteristic appearance of cop, a copper beaten skull. This occurs when a child has chronic hydrocephalus. And one can see how this does depict or is very similar to a uh, the copper beating of a drum. There are various treatments for hydrocephalus. Medical treatment includes the use of acetazolamide and furosemide. Acetazolamide is also utilized in the Himalayas or other mountainous regions for high altitude sickness. It is a medication that decreases the fluid content within the brain.